Okay, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Beatrice Ibarra, and I started the Ibarra Foundation, which is the organization that is hosting this event. And I'm going to share my screen to make sure um, you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Is this good? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so my name is Beatrice. I graduated from Rohana High School in 2013. I'm now an IT professional with an engineering degree, and I grew up in Lozano, so pretty much near the abandoned pharmacy, if it's still abandoned. All right. In high school, Eric, so this is mainly for you, is I was in super involved in everything I like to do the most. So here's a couple of organizations that I remember being in and that that was, I was in band, I played the saxophone, I did cheer, which is on the, you can see the top right, Joanne was also in that. I was also the mascot one year, I played a couple other sports and then I did some non-sports related events and it was, um, UIL, FFA. With UIL, I did the number sense and calculator, I think, and other mathematic events. And then masterminds with Braulio, and we were broadcasted on the news. And I don't, I, I try to look for the video of how we did, but I could never find it after that. I also volunteered um, at Valley Baptist when I think I was a freshman before I was 16. And once I was 16, I was a cashier at Kmart, which is no longer there in Harlingen. <laughs> But these are a couple pictures of some of the groups I was in. And then when I graduated as well from Rohando, and that was really fun. For college, I went to Michigan State University and I graduated in December of 2017. So I did about four and a half years there. And this is located in East Lansing, Michigan. I majored in applied engineering sciences, which everywhere else is called industrial engineering. And basically what industrial engineering is, is a mix of half engineering classes as well as half business classes. So for engineering classes, I can take anywhere from like statics, physics, calculus. And then in the business side, I took statistics, accounting, and classes that are really helpful if I ever wanted to start a business or kind of keep the whole business insight together um, alongside engineering. So it really helps when you know, engineers make plans and kind of the, I can use my degree to kind of help relay those plans to accounting and how to buy which parts and why certain parts are important and things like that. So this, this degree is really versatile compared to the other engineering degrees. And I absolutely um, love it. So I was also heavily involved with the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, AKA SHEP. And I loved going to their national conferences that they had every year, usually around the November timeframe. And they, they change cities and locations. But this conference is a huge opportunity for Hispanic engineers looking to get internships and jobs. So I interviewed with top companies like Twitter, Under Armour, um, and a bunch of companies like that. And my boyfriend even interviewed with Google and he didn't even apply. He just uploaded his resume to this conference database and Google found him and gave him an interview and that was really awesome. Like students, students' lives really change at this conference and I, I, love, I love for people to go. Even, and you don't have to be a SHEP member to go. I think it's just a little more expensive, but SHEP membership is $10 a year and I recommend it for all college students in, in uh, STEM fields. I was also super um, involved with CAMP, which is the College Assistant Migrant Program, and what they do, they're actually the ones that got me interested in Michigan State. They came to recruit at Rohando in their, uh, Rohando High School in their library, and I just happened to overhear them, but they're a college program that um, assists migrant students or students with migrant parents, and kind of helps give them the resources they need in college, so extra tutoring time or telling you, you know, especially in Michigan State, kind of how to navigate the college campus and really, you know, assigns you a mentor and make sure they, they want you to be successful in college. So that was my college experience and it was amazing. Another reason that I chose Michigan State is because of their study abroad program. 
And I actually went to a couple countries while I was at Michigan State, specifically for study abroad. I went to Mexico and that was with the camp program, which was really amazing. We got to volunteer for a week and a picture, the bottom right picture is actually me at Chichen Itza, which is in um, the Yucatan uh, Peninsula area of Mexico. And I went to a couple other countries and the most of these were in Europe and I actually did that in the second summer I was there so my sophomore year I went to Europe for a World War II class and we started off in the Netherlands in Amsterdam and then we went through all these countries that the Allies took so kind of following their path and then we and we finished up in Berlin Germany and it was really fun and really amazing oh another country I actually forgot to put on here was New Zealand and that's actually the bottom left picture and the New Zealand study abroad was really amazing because I actually did that before I even started the fall semester in college so this was actually the summer after I graduated in 2013 and two weeks prior to the fall semester starting a couple of us a couple of students flew out to New Zealand we did a two-week course there and we had a great time and it was actually a freshman seminar abroad is what the class was called so it was really to kind of get you into the mindset of collegiate classes and kind of I, the class was actually a zombie class and it was focused on the environmental impact of humans on the earth and it was really awesome. And I really recommend that all students take a study abroad course if they can. For summer internships, so an internship is a job that you have while you're in college. Um, you don't have your degree yet, but you're working towards it. So companies allow you to work for them and kind of gain experience so that when you're looking for a full-time job, you have, you have an idea of what you want to do, right? <clears throat> so it's kind of like dating for the job that you want to have as a full-time career. So I had two internships. I did work for DT Energy, which is a, a utilities company. In Detroit, Michigan, I worked for them for two summers and they are a Fortune 500 company. I looked up their rank and today they're number 220. And so what Fortune 500 is, is the top uh, 500 companies in the world, whether it's uh, you know gross revenue and, and how successful they are. So they are pretty much up there and that's a pretty good rank. <clears throat> and what's really amazing is that a lot of STEM internships are, are actually paid. Uh, some are unpaid, but you can find a lot that are paid. And the first summer when I was a sophomore, I worked for $15 an hour. And this is a 40-hour full-time job, but you're an intern. And then the next summer, I got a, I got a raise for, being, for having another year of experience in school as well as working for them. I got a raise to $16 an hour, which is a great, uh, great job to have while you're in college. And then my, the, my last internship, so the summer before I graduated, I worked for Verizon, and this was in New Jersey. And their current Fortune 500 rank is number 19, which is amazing that I was able to get a job with a really top company like that. I was a data analytics intern, which was amazing. Uh, I worked with um, a bunch of big data for Verizon. I helped them kind of calculate the cost that it would take to um, put 5G across the nation. So that was really awesome. I can't really talk about it too much after that, but they actually paid for my room and board. So they paid for my apartment and, um, and this apartment was really amazing. And they also paid for my transportation, meaning that they paid for a driver to come pick me up from my apartment and take me to work and back every day. So they were really generous and they paid me $21 an hour for 40 hours. Um, and usually summer internships last about 10 to 12 weeks. So that's a great amount of money for you to save up to help pay for college or help pay for you know, living expenses during your college uh, semesters. But going back to the DT Energy, I was a quality management intern. And so what I did there was kind of focusing on management project skills. So making, learning how to document a project and, and all, that was very, a lot of documentation, but I love that job. I love the teams that I worked with and that's some information on the summer internships. My current career, I worked for a year at this small company called Technoform and that's where I started my data analytics uh, full-time position. 
And the data analyst works with a lot of data, whether it's in Excel or different, I guess, sources that you can use. And then I decided I wanted to do something a little more technical than that. And I applied for Parker Hannafin, which is where I'm currently at. I'm an IT technical analyst, which um, is also, you can also refer to us as a system administrator. And their Parker's Fortune 500 rank is 251, and that's pretty good. And they also, they also paid for my Linux certification. So I got to go back to college for a little bit to get, the, to get certified, and they paid for that. A system administrator is, and this is from Google, is a person who is responsible for the upkeep, configuration, and reliable operation of computer systems, especially multi-user computers such as servers. So I work with the server portion, and here's a picture of um, this middle picture. It's kind of the servers that I would work with, and that, that's a pretty accurate representation of what it would look like if I needed to go into the data center. But most of my day-to-day -day work kind of looks like a hacker's, I guess, uh, environment where I'm working with, um, it's called command line, and it's usually that black screen that you see in hacker movies with a bunch of colorful text uh, going across the screen. That's, that's the environment I work in every day. So I'm able to work from home during this time. When I talked about earlier about creating the Ibarra Foundation, I created this foundation be, um, in remembrance of my father who passed away about five years ago. He would actually have me take math tests um, when I got home, like in pre-K and kinder. So he would have math tests ready for me and I would have to answer all these multiplication problems in my head, in pen, and I would have to get it right and he would test me. So math became a really important part of my life and I wanted to give back to the Real Hondo community, um, especially to students who wanna pursue similar things that I do. And so we provide a scholarship and this year we're gonna give two $100 scholarships um, to a student who wins, uh, wins, wins the prize. And then this picture is actually April Juarez, which won the last year. And so we were able to give her the scholarship and also, if you can see in the picture, she has a pink stole, which is the, um, you can see it says Ibarra Scholar. So that's another, another perk that the student will receive when they win the scholarship, as well as a sponsored cap and gown. What the Ibarra Foundation also does is I've created some programs for the students that do win the, the scholarship. They're automatically enrolled into our Ibarra Scholars Program, and we focus on, depending on your level, uh, focus on different things. So for high school seniors, which is, since this program is so new, is mainly the people that are gonna be joining, and what I want the high school seniors to focus on is college readiness, so something similar to this workshop, kind of picking out your major, um, getting you ready for college, FAFSA, and all of that, and then professional development. So let's get your resume ready, let's get it collegiate level, and kind of start getting you to think about what kind of job you want after you graduate college. And actually our next event is a resume workshop for beginners, absolute beginners who don't even know what a resume is. And that'll be October 11th, which is a Sunday, um, same time, 2 p.m. Central. And if you need to contact the foundation for anything, we have our email here at ibarra.foundation at gmail.com. And any resources for any students that kind of want to think about um, if they want to pursue something in data, data analytics or system administration, these are some websites that I think would be great to check out if you want to see if you're interested in it. So Code Codecademy is great. I think you get a seven day free trial to try out um, some classes in data analytics. So if you want to pursue that career, I recommend taking the classes in SQL and um, learning about Tableau, which is um, a data visualization tool that I use during my internships. If you want to become a sysadmin like me, I recommend taking the Bash Shell class at Codecademy. And if you want to build websites, which is something that I've actually um, you know, had to learn for my nonprofit and all of that, uh, I would recommend using or learning the HTML and CSS class. So that's the front end of the website. So picking the design and all of that, that that's what you would learn there. As, um, as well as YouTube has 
so many videos that you could learn from and I would recommend for the sysadmin learning some Linux courses, command line and scripting. So those are the words you wanna Google um, or put into YouTube if you wanna learn what my job is about or learn, start learning the skills that my job requires. And that is uh, the end of my presentation. <laughs> that was an uh, information overload, but like I'd like to uh, thanks. Where we'll have questions later. Remember, I'm live streaming on Facebook here, just in case you're curious about my phone. But um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Joanne. She's going to be our moderator for the event, and she. Well, and can I can I say real quick, B? Um, since you are Facebook live streaming it. If someone has questions on Facebook, put in the comments and, and you can look at them and we can answer those questions too. Sounds good. I'll, I'll type them in there. Okay. All right. Wait, B, are you going to share the, the slides that you made about our intros or? Oh yeah. Um, I can definitely post that up if you want to. Yeah, talk. go ahead and post mine and I can explain and then introduce Braulio and Kristen using theirs as well. <laughs> okay, cool. Awesome. So my introduction is going to be pretty brief because I'm not in the STEM field. I'm in a healthcare field. I'm just moderating the discussion today. Uh, but I am a 2013 RHS grad, just like Beatrice. Uh, I was valedictorian of our class, which was really um, awesome. Worked hard for that, so <laughs> got there. My career path is a little different than everybody else here, but I studied communication disorders at Texas State University. Um, and I got my undergraduate degree there. I also did some research while I was uh, completing my undergraduate there. Um, and then I went to the University of Texas at Dallas to get my master's of science and graduated in December of 2017 with my master's. Um, since then, I've actually worked in a lot of different areas of practice in the healthcare field. I'm a certified brain injury specialist and I like to work with traumatic brain injury and stroke recovery. Um, I recently moved back to the Valley though, and so I'm with kids right now, and um, I think something that you can pull out of my history that relates to everybody else is just that practices can be really flexible and have a lot more opportunities than you know. So just getting to know what you can do in your field is really valuable, and I hope that y'all can get some information about the STEM field from everybody that's on here today. Um, I am also starting the speech, uh, sorry, I've also been featured in a speech and censored podcast talking about mindfulness and SLP practice, um, as well as done a little mini course uh, with Boss Babes ATX, uh, a nonprofit that's a woman-based program in Austin on the neuroscience behind fatigue. So I kind of like to dive deep into topics in my field and share them with people, which has brought me to my newest uh, adventure, which is called The Courageous Clinician where I'll be starting a podcast and a community to support people to have discussions like this uh, that you're attending today for the STEM field in the world of speech pathology. So uh, next up, we're gonna give the mic over to Kristen, who's gonna explain a little bit about herself before uh, we pop over to Braulio and then open up the panel. Perfect. All right, um, so my name is Kristen Krafka. I graduated from Rohondo High School in 2012. Um, I currently work in wetland restoration and wetland mitigation banking with the Earth Partners. Um, so a little bit, okay, there we go. Um, I graduated from Texas A&M University um, in, under ecological restoration and wildlife and fisheries. I graduated in 2016 and um, between, during college, I waited tables for about three years. Uh, A&M offers some internship programs, and so I actually got to intern in Washington, D.C., and I was a congressional intern for Congressman Philemon Villa, and he is, he's the South Texas congressman. Uh, so it was, it was really cool, and having the experience to go work for a local congressman in Washington, D.C., and also getting to travel back to the Valley with him. I actually, that was in 2015, um, and I got to bring the congressman to Rohondo High School, and he did a little presentation for the seniors there at the high school. Um, I worked in a soil technician lab in college as well, and I just, I, we ran soil samples, um, kind of figuring out the composition and the chemical components of soil samples. Uh, I 
And then after I graduated college, I went back to DC. I interned for a consulting company called Booz Allen Hamilton, and I got to do um, environmental compliance work for Department of Defense, uh, which I, I had no idea that that was even a thing until I got this internship. And then after, after my internship with Booz Allen Hamilton, I came back to Texas. Uh, I worked as an ecologist for a company out in Nacogdoches, Texas, out in East Texas and um, doing wetland mitigation banking. So that's kind of, that's, that was the beginning of how I got into the field that I am in now. Uh, and again, I didn't know mitigation banking, what it was, that was a thing. I mean, I barely talked about it in college and I just kind of stumbled upon it. Um, I worked there for about a year and then I worked at Harris County Flood Control District in Houston over um, last year and a half. Uh, also working on their own mitigation banks and then and now I work at the Earth Partners it's almost a year um, again just managing all of their mitigation banks that they have um, and during that time I also went back to school and got a master's um, in environmental management. So, so real quick can you explain to us what mitigation banking is a little bit just for people that don't know any background there? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's my next slide. Um, and I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible because even I sometimes have issues <laughs> explaining mitigation banking. It, it's kind of in depth. Um, but the easiest way to explain it, it's, it's kind of broken into two components. So really my day-to-day -day job is uh, wetland restoration work. We take degraded ecosystems and we either do a lot of earthwork and a lot of vegetation planting and we restore it back to a, to a wetland um, e uh, ecosystem. And we do this over thousands of acres. I mean, uh, I work in Houston currently and we've got three different pieces of properties around the Houston area, um, both forested and emergent, like just grass type wetlands. Um, we do that because there is a federal law and regulation that if anyone destroys a wetland, they have to replace it somewhere else. And so instead of, um, instead of a random person trying to create a half an acre of wetland somewhere randomly, we take it, we, we take large swaths of, of land and restore them. Um, and then people that there's a way to measure the function of these wetlands. We turn that into a credit, like a, like a, uh, almost like a voucher kind of uh, and then we sell that to whoever destroys a wetland uh, and that's how we make the business it, it's a pretty um, large business people don't really know about it until they realize they have to impact a wetland and then buy a wetland credit um, but we're extremely important to keep the industry and like keep development moving I mean it goes from TxDOT having to build a road um, across a river even to um, you know, someone at B's company building, you know, large buildings. I mean, or, or an HEB down the street building on top of a wetland. Um, and so, let me see. If, so, yeah, so you can either read the super lengthy, like what I pulled from the internet definition, or I try breaking it down. Um, someone destroyed a wetland, you've got to replace it. Uh, like I said, instead of Joe Schmo creating a tiny wetland in their backyard to comply with federal regulations, they come to us. We do all of the down and dirty work and restore a piece of wetland and then they can walk away and build whatever they want. Um, and so, and my job is managing people to create these wetlands and to restore these wetlands. Um, so uh, it's a mixture of different fields almost. So we've got to do, we've got to work with federal and local agencies. Uh, we've got to work with Army Corps of Engineers to permit these banks. All of, all of these pieces of lands are federally protected and then we have to monitor them and count trees and count grasses uh, and do some technical scoring over the course of 10 years. Um, and, and, and it is federally protected so we, it, it stays protected for the rest of our lives. Um, and so it's really cool I get to, I can go out and ride ATVs and go look at trees and go count grasses some days and other days I sit behind my computer and I manage budgets and I do financial spreadsheets. <laughs> so it's just kind of a compilation of, of 
various uh, industries all lumped to one. And like I, yeah, like I said, I, I manage consultants a lot, um, but I do get to go out in the field uh, and I work with government agencies and I go to multiple conferences and take some continuing education classes like wetland delineation. Um, the fun there's a functional assessment tool we have to use to measure the function of these wetlands that we're trained in. Um, and then I do a lot of technical writing too. So writing and communication is really big in this field. And just so you, so people can be aware, um, these mitigation banks exist all over the place. And I'll, I'll reiterate, when I say mitigation bank, don't think of your Wells Fargo bank down the street. Um, it's, it's really just a protected piece of land that we get to go restore and play on. Um, and, and so they're, they're, they're everywhere. You don't even realize probably if you go across, across Texas and see these big forests or something that it's a federally protected land. Um, and so, um, you know, my degree is a Bachelor of Science in Ecological Restoration, um, but there, you could have multiple degrees to get this kind of a job or be in this kind of a field. And that includes environmental science, forestry, wildlife and fisheries, restoration ecology, rangeland management, and spatial science with GIS. And GIS is like map making skills um, that's super important to our job if, if you really like um, if you think you like making maps, like GIS is really interesting and you can do it either for the environment or there's also a people like city development type component to GIS work. Um, and this is just a short group of them. It, 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 I'm just trying to show you all that any degree um, in the environmental field, if you can dream it, you can have that job. Um, and, and then these are kind of the people I work with on a day to day basis. If you don't want to do mitigation banking, um, but you want to do something in this field, like these are the kind of people I work with every day. And you can do environmental consulting uh, with wetland delineations, uh, stream assessments. We do, yeah, we do stream restoration too. Um, and you can do any kind of permitting, whether that's TECQ, um, environmental quality in Austin or Army Corps of Engineers that helps um, with like big infrastructure. Uh, urban forestry, parks and rec, parks, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, I mean, there, there is a, if you like some part of the environment, I mean, we've, we, I can help you find something. There's, um, I, I stumbled across mitigation banking, and um, it, it's a great field. There's way more jobs out there than you realize there are. Sorry, I just shared our live stream to the actual event center, but Kristen, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Uh, I definitely thought of a bank when you said mitigation banking. <laughs> so uh, I like your type of bank a lot better than my normal type of bank. <laughs> Braulio, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, can, can you guys hear me? Just uh, Awesome, sure. yeah, you're thank in, you. we're ready to go. Uh, Beatrice, do you mind sharing uh, that very short bio that you, um, so graciously put together for us. Generously created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my, uh, my, my presentation in bio is going to be just a little bit shorter uh, than the other two outstanding women who uh, went before me. <laughs> we'll, we'll take your responses in the panel <laughs> just as yeah. much as we take a PowerPoint, Braulio. I, I appreciate that. So um, <laughs> just, just a little bit about me. Uh, Braulio Garza also graduated from uh, Rio Hondo High School as well, class of 2012. Don't remember what my rank was, but... I'm here. So <laughs> uh, I was vice president to Kristen Krafka. So Kristen was our class president. Um, it's very honored to serve under her. Um, so graduated uh, high school in 2012. I attended Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. It's about uh, seven hours north of Rio Hondo. Um, so I think it was just enough to get away from being in the valley, but close enough to sort of come back, uh, you know, whenever I wanted. I, I recommend Sam Houston State. To anybody and everybody, they have, uh, I, I didn't pursue criminal justice, but they have a very good criminal justice program there. Um, so I got my degree in political science and minored in uh, communication studies. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer um, and maybe in the future. But uh, once I graduated, I realized, uh, you know, going to law school is uh, sort of expensive and, and a little time consuming. And, and so I, I took a detour and, and I uh, got a job with um, the uh, United States Department of Transportation. And I was uh, assigned in Westlaco to a metropolitan planning organization. Um, basically what they did was uh, they budgeted 
uh, monies and, and dollars for um, highways, uh, basically any sort of road, um, anything and everything you think of county roads, farm roads, uh, highways, and anything uh, regarding transportation. Um, then I got a wild hair and I thought I wanted to move to Houston. And so I found the first job that would take me in Houston, uh, which led me to SBA Towers and, and SBA is in the business. Uh, I'm sure we pass or all of y'all pass um, cell phone towers every single day and you might wonder who owns those. Typically those are out resource and, and there's about three large companies who, who own most of them and, and SBA at the time was, um, was the second largest owner of, of towers. Didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but um, I got the job and I worked for them um, primarily uh, basically helping them um, file for, for permits. So whether it was city permits, county permits, FAA, that type of stuff. Um, and then I, I uh, got another wild hair and I thought I wanted to move again. So I went to Charlotte uh, and, and I joined uh, what I'm now with T-Mobile. And, and so this next um, slideshow that I have will tell you a little bit about what I do. I, I was gonna I was gonna mention some of the things that, that I did in high school, but I believe some of the questions uh, sort of cover that. So I'll, I'll sort of save that um, for, for just a little bit later. I'm gonna share my screen now, Beatrice. Um, so I think I might take control. Okay, let me see here. So mine's very short and sweet. Uh, I basically just wanna tell you guys what I do currently. Uh, I'm a project manager for, uh, let me know when you guys can see my screen. I think I'm sure. You can sure. see your screen Good. Okay. Now. Perfect, perfect. So, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, I now work for T-Mobile and, and I'm a project manager. Uh, I, I didn't pull anything from Google because a project manager is exactly what it sounds like. You're literally managing a project and, and for what it's worth, anything can be a project, even in high school. Uh, you know, you got to write a paper, you got to do some sort of presentation. Um, I'm sure Beatrice manages some sort of project, you know, Kristen as well with, with the banks. Um, but but that's the job title, very broad. But but we do a lot of stuff. And, and so what we're in the business of, as I like to think of it, is um, we're in the business of, of an experience. And that experience comes in the way of cell phones and, and networks. And so um, I work for the North Carolina Development and Engineering um, department. And, and so we do everything and anything um, that deals with T-Mobile's network in the North Carolina state, do some sites in, in South Carolina. And so I, I want to share you guys, um, I want to share with you guys our, our mission statement. Our mission is to grow the business and delight our customers, because ultimately that's what we're working for. We accomplish this by being focused on our speed to market with unsurpassed quality that is efficient, flexible, adaptable, and builds relationships through, through strategic partnering. Um, now, I, I would recommend being a project manager for anybody that one likes to tell people what to do, because uh, that's, I think, 80% of my job. But more so, if, uh, if you find yourself um, really enjoying puzzles or, or trying to figure out problems, that I think is, is the majority of my job. Every single day is, is a little bit different. And, and, and I'll sort of uh, go into the next slide and show you guys what I do from a, from a very technical aspect. There's a, there's a long list of things that we have to uh, do before we can get um, our, our radios and, and equipment up. Oh, give me a second. Okay. There we go. So in, in, in my line of work, we can basically break it down into two parts. We have soft cost side of things and the hard cost side of things. The soft cost uh, side of things is, you know, we first start off with um, cell site contracts. And so, as I mentioned before, there's several companies um, that own these, you know, large structures. And so prior to that, we get with our radio frequency um, department and we, they, they tell us, okay, this is the technology that we want. We want certain, you know, frequencies shooting at this. And essentially that's how we bring you guys LTE or in the past 4G and now 5G, which is, which is something very good. And so for, for months, we sort of plan on what exactly what we're going to do in what areas. Um, North Carolina has, has a lot of mountains. And so we, we have to look at this entire map and think, okay, where is our population at? Where do we have service? Where do we not have service? What can we actually do, right? And so, again, the, the, the first side of things on soft costs is getting the contracts in place. So we'll, we'll go to these companies and say, we want these technologies, these radios at, at this height. Um, but it, 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 so that's the first part. And then we got a permit and zoning. So Kristen mentioned you know, earlier in her line of work, that is a big thing. Um, a lot of these things sit in, in counties, cities overlapping, again, uh, we we got to deal with the, with the federal uh, administration of, of, of aviation. We got to run structural analysis. So 
each tower has a certain capacity or load that it can take. Um, and if our antennas are too big, then we have either have to pay for modifications or we have to pick some other cell site. And so that's part of it. Ultimately, what we want to work to is uh, a notice to proceed to construction, basically meaning you guys are good to go. You guys can actually construct it. Everything matches. All the technologies are there. You have the contract in place. All your permits are in place. Cell site's good to go. And now we sort of go to the hard cost, which is what I'm more involved with now. What that involves is uh, reviewing construction drawings. Um, so you have to review these and make sure everything's up to, you know, codes and standards and, and, and that the build is exactly the way you want it. Uh, you got to actually schedule the construction. So on a weekly basis, we construct anywhere between 30 to 50 sites. Now that might not seem like a lot, but we only have seven days to construct and we sort of have to meet our run rate. So quite a bit of scheduling goes in place. Um, North Carolina isn't as big as Texas, but it's very long. So, you know, scheduling where, where our tower crews are going to be at can get a little hectic. Uh, in my line of work, I actually get to go to these cell phone sites and uh, sort of see the construction that's going on. Um, that's a little fun because it gets you out of the uh, normal, you know, eight to five office uh, type of feel. It can take you anywhere to the coast, the mountains, you know. Uh, and then finally, what we call on airing the cell site. So, once the construction is completed, um, we have to on air uh, these, these sites, basically meaning that we're turning it up and we're turning it on and all the um, radio frequency that's shooting out of that cell site is going now to your phones, essentially. So that's a, that's a very, like I said, basic explanation of what we do, but every day is, is very different. You know, um, I come into the office and, and it's never the same story. Every single day is something different and I'm gonna get into a little bit more of what I do on a day to day on the next slide. So I do four, four things very, very, um, again, broad. I run what we call the AAV program, which is the alternate access vendor. Um, basically what that is, is bringing in fiber to our cell site. So um, third party vendors uh, sell us basically their fiber connection, which is um, how we get connected to the internet essentially. And so I'm in charge of the entire state of North Carolina and bringing in fiber to those cell sites, um, basically helping us transmit our, our signal. I also work with the special projects and challenge sites. Um, what does that mean? It can mean a lot of things. Uh, a cell phone tower fell. Uh, there's birds on the site. Uh, another carrier is imposing on our rad center. Uh, and during hurricanes, you know, cell phone site again came down or something stuck there. Branches are stuck up there. There's been some crazy things that we've seen. And so those are really one off stuff. And again, every day that I come in, I have something of this sort. So it's never the same story. I'm always having to basically mitigate problems, essentially. Overall project coordination, I sort of talked about that on the last slide. So from point A to point B, I mentioned probably about eight or nine very, very broad things. And so we're talking about on a yearly basis, we do about 3000 sites. And so you sort of have to drive all of those sites from point A to point B, which can get a little bit, you know, it's, it, when you think about 3000 sites, it, it's kind of a lot. And then, of course, ultimately, uh, we have uh, management and shareholders. So on top of actually doing the work, we now have to report our progress to um, the bigwigs, you know, the, the, the VPs and the CEOs of the company, and um, uh, basically to let them know and ensure them that we're getting the job that they wanted us to do and, and how that impacts our shareholders or some of y'all, if some of y'all have uh, T-Mobile. Um, so that's very broad of what I do. And, and I, you know, I talked about my, uh, my degree earlier. It's not a science degree. It's not an engineering degree. Um, I, I kind of lucked into the job a little bit, but I also had the, the, the know-how and, and the want to, if you will. Um, I minored in communications. So that's really big. Project managing is all about communicating with your different vendors. Uh, you're, on a daily basis, I talk to probably about 25 people and, and I sort of boss them around and tell them what to do, how to get it done. You know, again, problem solve all day for 10 to 12 hours a day. It's fun though. Nothing's ever the same. I, I truly enjoy my work. And, and again, if you kind of like uh, being the one to tell people what to do, then it's for you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And that was, yeah, a little bit about me. Hey, thank you, Braulio, that was great. So some takeaways that I'm kind of getting already uh, is that there's lots of different career paths. It seems like each one of you guys comes from a very diverse background, some backgrounds, that didn't even know you were gonna land in STEM, but you're here. And so uh, I think that can be encouraging to listeners uh, as well as, you know, not 
having to feel like you have the perfect pathway and the perfect GPA or the perfect degree to get you where you need to go, that there's lots of opportunities um, across the board. So that's really cool. Um, some of the questions that we plan to discuss, I think, have already been addressed by the intros. And for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of bounce around um, in the numbers. But I think everybody has shared a good amount about what got them into the STEM field. Is there anything else that you guys would like to share um, about kind of what, what got you to where you are now? Are we good? I can ask good. something to the question. Yeah, so I know for okay, cool. engineers, um, they become engineers because they want to change the world. They want to build something, you know, beautiful, or they want to maybe build something that, like mechanical engineers, for instance, help build a prosthetic body parts. So they want to help people that way. I want to do good in the world, but I pursued engineering for the salary and the difference that I can make in my family. So that I was embarrassed about that reason at the beginning, but I felt it's a valid reason to want to pursue a heavily paid career. And I encourage students to pursue that as well if that's something that they need to do to provide for their family or provide for themselves. A STEM career has a very large range of salaries and um, it would it'd be great to look into majors and what kind of salaries that they make on average after graduation. And that's a good way to maybe help you decide on what major you want um, and what kind of lifestyle you want to live. So that's my cool. So point. let's actually branch off of that, uh, kind of making decisions in the STEM field. What are some high school classes or early career opportunities that made you realize that working in science, technology, engineering is something that would be uh, nice for you, like finances? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll answer that because my I feel like mine was pretty straightforward, honestly. Um, Rohando offered a club called Envirathon, and it was an after-school environmental type uh, club, and there was competitions. Um, and you know, we we spent every Wednesday afternoon going over um, learning about trees, learning about different types of soils, learning about how how agriculture plays a big uh, component in the environmental world, um, learning about how development impacts the environment. And it, it was just really interesting and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I did it for all four years of high school and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something environmental um, in college. And at the time I picked the major ecological restoration because it sounded cool. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I just said that looks different and unique and I'm gonna do it. And the first day of college like that, now, now I will say, I chose Texas A&M because my family went to Texas A&M. Um, and that was pretty much the only reason I chose that college. But there's tons of colleges that um, probably has a better environmental field. Hopefully no one from A&M is listening to this because it may not be the best thing. And We are uh, live stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I loved A&M and I'd, I'd always go back and I'll make my children go to A&M. But, you know, that there's so many other schools out there and like environmental programs that you can look at into, both big and small. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's, that was really the program in high school that I can pinpoint that, you know, having that opportunity and having that extracurricular activity in school, um, that did it, that, that signed me up for the rest of my life, really. Perfect. Yeah, I don't think, uh, Mr. R, is that program still going on right now? I know Ms. Wilmoth is no longer teaching at Harlingen High School. Is anybody still doing the after school Envirothon? Not this year, or this past year we didn't have it. I I may need to kick my mom in the butt a little bit. She's a new <laughs> industry teacher to get that going because I think that that fosters a lot of uh, opportunity. What about you, Braulio? I know you kind of said you looked into this, but you've obviously stuck with the career. Sure, so sure. what's keeping you here? Well, uh, you know, uh, I think Beatrice talked about it. Um, uh, you know, I actually hail from just a couple of yards away from where Beatrice grew up also, not in Lozano per se, but just across the tracks. Um, and so, you know, staying in this field, uh, 
like, like Beatrice said, sort of knowing the lifestyle that I wanted to live and ultimately helping my family. Um, you know, we're, we're from the Rio Grande Valley and it, it's no secret that it, many families, you know, are either really close to the poverty line or, or just slightly above it. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's um, very truthful to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad Beatrice mentioned it, that uh, most of these, you know, STEM fields, um, jobs pay really, really well and, and they open doors, not just for you, but, um, but for your brothers and sisters and, and perhaps future kids and moms and dads and grandpas. And so um, one, that, that's one of the reasons too, uh, I, again, I, you know, I, I sort of wanted to be a lawyer in the beginning, but I've always liked just figuring things out. You know, you give me a problem and, and getting to the solution uh, is, is, is what I'm, I'm very goal oriented, you know? Um, and so that's what I get to do every single day. Uh, and, and I enjoy it. It's never boring. Uh, I'm always on the go. There's always something different. Um, and, you know, I, I think growing up, or at least in high school, I wasn't too fond of math, uh, but I did like science. Science is really, really fun. I, you know, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, um, you know, and, and now working uh, alongside some really, really bright minds here in, in North Carolina. It's really cool. I'm, I'm actually thinking about going back and uh, perhaps getting some sort of a electrical engineering degree, which, which might be cool, um, which hopefully pays me more, obviously. Uh, there's, there's, there's no one class, you know, when I was in Rio Hondo, what I will say is um, two teachers, I, I think one of them's still there and one of them's not, um, Coach Savage, Judson Savage was really influential. And the other person, uh, I believe he's still there, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. R, is, was uh, Mr. Quintanilla, uh, Mr. Q. You know, he, he wanted me to, to study criminal justice, but I think ultimately, you know, my, my experience was a little bit different. Um, no one in my family had gone to college before. It was very um, trial and error. You know, looking back in college, I wish I had done more internships. I wish I had been in more programs, but I was sort of just trying to figure it out as I went along. You know, there was no sort of guidance there. And I think that that might be the case for some of you guys. And some of you guys are, are very fortunate to have, you know, older siblings that have been through it, sort of the ringer, if you will. And, and so take their sage uh, advice. Um, but, you know, ultimately your, your, your teachers for the most part want the best for you. And, and Mr. Q, no matter, you know, he pushed me to criminal justice. I didn't really want to do criminal justice. But at the end of the day, he told me, you know, just go to college and, and just finish. You know, if you start something, finish it. And, and so when I said I, I looked into it, it, it was obviously um, a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, going to college, sticking through it. Again, being the first one several times where I thought maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I, I just got to go back home and, and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with going back home necessarily. But I, I think the, the, the lesson that I learned there from, from uh, again, both Coach Savage and Mr. Q was if you start something, finish it. And if you see it through, more than likely the end result is going to be better for you, you know. Nice. So I think that brings up a good point is it doesn't have to be necessarily a specific topic, but it could be just a teacher or somebody that kind of motivated you to have a passion to kind of move forward or just a personality trait of wanting to solve things and figuring out that that can be fostered in, in a career path. So awesome. All right. So our, uh, Beatrice, do you want to add anything on to that or how are you feeling? I want to get to know what Eric wants to do. So I just messaged him privately to make sure he wanted to share on his own. But Eric, is, um, uh, Eric we're going to put you on the spotlight <laughs> since you're our student attendee. Eric, what interests you about a uh, STEM field right now? Engineering. Engineering, and is it like why why engineering? So is it like you like like you know math or you like to solve problems or just you know computers interest you where are you going there uh we had a career in second grade and the engineer came and i liked it and since then i wanted to be an engineer great what kind of engineer were they do you remember I remember but i want to be a mechanical or a civil engineer wow nice wow and it seems like engineering is pretty wide. So if you were to get into college and something else sparks your interest, it, you have lots of places to go with that uh, interest there. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing, Eric. Um, another question I want to ask, I know we're getting short on time. Is it okay if we go five minutes over with everybody so we can touch up a little bit more for the high schoolers? Okay. Yeah. Um, so what, can y'all just briefly describe a little bit about like STEM career culture? So something that can be shocking for students when they get into an actual career after, after schooling, whether it's a high school or 
going to get their master's or getting an undergraduate degree is just the actual culture of the career and, and what a career actually looks like day to day, including relationships with bosses and other employees. Tell me a little bit about your career culture. I Whoever wants to take the reins yeah, first. I, I can start if you guys <laughs> want. Um, so again, I, I work for, uh, for T-Mobile. Um, and, and we pride ourselves, and I think most, most companies do, uh, we're what we like to call um, very, very progressive. And so whereas in, in you know, slightly older days, um, everyone sort of wear a suit and tie um, to, to, to work, which is fun, by the way, we were talking about earlier, dressing up and, and getting spiffy is fun. But, you know, at, at T-Mobile, I, I told them a story earlier. My first day I, I showed up, you know, three piece to the T and everyone was wearing jeans and, and t-shirts. So that was a bit of a culture shock. Um, you know, in high school, I, I worked for, uh, for HEB and then in college, I worked at Walmart. And so uh, punching the clock was something that I got very used to, you know, come in at a certain time, leave at a certain time, take a, take a lunch at a certain time. Um, and, and at least from, from my experience, uh, I won't speak for anyone else, um, at, at, at T-Mobile, you're very much given a lot of um, flexibility there. You know, for, for the most part, you obviously want to come in at, at a good time and leave at a good time. But uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, I think my manager stressed that you guys uh, are, you know, your your past high school, your past college, you're sort of uh, coming into adulthood. And, and so they're going to treat you like one, um, you know, and, and so there was for my again, for me, there's not a whole lot of micromanaging. I could typically come in when I want and leave when I want. Um, there are several, you know, regular seven to eight hour work days or some 12 work day, you know, 12 hour work days, 15 hour work days, just sort of depending on the schedule. Um, so that was a bit of a culture shock for me. Again, sort of going from those jobs at, at Walmart and HEB and punching the clock and being expect, you know, being micromanaged uh, to just sort of given this freedom, you know, so, but our, our, our culture is really cool. I mean, it, you know, everyone's pretty open. Um, T-Mobile's done a lot of really, really cool things um, in, in the last two years, you know, um, for, uh, for women, um, people who, you know, people of color. Um, so they, they, they have a lot of programs, um, things that, that benefit me and, 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 and uh, the, the other speakers here. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really cool. And so again, um, I can't speak for any other company, but um, if you ever thought about a career in T-Mobile, the culture is, is amazing. It's one of, the, one of my favorite things and actually part of, the, part, part of what keeps me here. Nice. That's a good point to bring up about the open schedule because for somebody who's really self-driven, that could be a great placement, but for somebody who maybe wants to be told what to do, that could be a really scary place to be. So that's something good to consider. Uh, Kristen B, who wants to go next? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Okay, I mean, so I've, I've had a very same, a similar experience as Braulio in the sense of, you know, there are some eight hour work days, there are some 12, there are some four, and there's really, you know, I'm, I've been very blessed with the autonomy of as long as you get your job done, like do whatever you want. Right. I mean, that's, um, that's very much been my mantra since I've, uh, I've had my, uh, my jobs, but I've also worked for very small companies. Um, uh, my very first company, I, we probably had 15 people. Harris County flood control district was larger. Um, and that, but that was a public agency. And currently, um, I work for a team of five, uh, and so I, we know everyone, we talk, and it's very, I, I think for me, it's amazing how much it doesn't feel like an office. Um, I, go to, uh, I go to work every day with friends, we talk about our feelings, and, <laughs> um, and, and we all just get our work done, and, and a lot of the responsibility uh, falls on me because we are a team of five and if I mess up there's no one to pick up my slack <laughs> um, so I, I think the biggest takeaway is that there is a workplace environment for everyone whether you are someone that needs to be a little bit more micromanaged and have someone make sure that you're you're checking all the boxes um, that's out there or if you need a little bit more autonomy that's out there too uh, and and you get the opportunity to find that place and find that office space. Um, it may take a couple of jobs to get there, but if you push and look, they, they are out there. Um, and I for for me, it's don't don't feel bad whenever you have a job and it doesn't feel right. Um, that's my biggest thing is that you you go find a job that you feel comfortable in and you feel like you can grow and learn from the people that that you work with. 
Yeah, I think so far everybody's resume has reflected a couple of different job changes, considering that we're all pretty young and pretty new in the field. That's something that kids can take away that you're not stuck in a job once you start a job to stay there. Yeah. So great. B, what do you have to cherry on top for this this one? So for this question, I work our workplace culture ice cream cone. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, previously I worked for a smaller company about maybe, and it was attached to a plant. So it was an office and a plant manufacturing plant. And that culture was a lot more relaxed. Um, it was maybe max hundred people in the building at, the, at a time. I, that was a big jump considering my internships were for larger companies. And I realized that I am much more at home in a large scale company. So currently I work at the headquarters prior to COVID and there's about at least 800 people in the building at a time. It's a very large building with a cafeteria, a gym, um, and very awesome amenities in the building itself. And um, it's more, this company is kind of old. It's over a hundred years old. So it, it was very professional in the sense of uh, suit and tie, but the rules have relaxed a lot more throughout the years, especially recently. Um, we are still, for example, only allowed to wear polos in the summer uh, and not any other season. So there's still some rules like that. But now that we're working from home, it's definitely a lot more relaxed, but it's still business casual as far as attire. And um, I work mainly with my team, which is a group of five of us. And it's very family oriented because you have to think about your spending more hours with them than you are really at home with your significant others. If you're working, you know, Monday through Friday, of course you have your weekends off, but uh, you're, this is your second home essentially with your career. So you want to make sure you like it and you like the people that you work with because that could, that could make or break your, your career. So I love yeah. a big company and I had to learn that the hard way out of college and had to switch jobs. Thanks for sharing that courage with us because I think learning the hard way can sometimes be a little scary. <laughs> so um, closing everything up, I know we're a little over time. Can everybody just give one statement? So try and keep it to like a sentence or two about a piece of advice or words of encouragement that you would give to a high schooler who is either looking into STEM or maybe just graduated or is exploring options to, to help them as they go through this process. Raleo, you can take it away first if you're ready. You look like you're thinking really hard. And I yeah, yeah. It. Well, it's, it's, I mean, there's there, there's a lot, I, so I'm trying to try. I can to, go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll pass it over to Kristen. She's ready. Yeah, because I, I give the same advice to everyone in the sense of whether you are graduating from college or you are coming right out of high school and you're looking for a job and college isn't the place to go, um, regardless of what your path is, you make yourself known. There, everyone's looking for a job. Um, and you need to go and make that extra step to get employed. Um, if you just submit a resume, a resume is great, um, but you're just another piece of paper in a stack. Um, put the extra effort in, go talk to, you know, go submit your resume, but then go and ask for the manager, go put your face in front of them. Don't wait for them to set up an interview with you. You go get that interview. Um, if, if you are driven for that job, then you go get that job and it'll really impress your future employers um, and it, it'll most likely help you land that job rather than just applying and waiting for them to come and respond to you. On advice. Yeah, I no, love that. Resumes count though, so go attend B's resume <laughs> workshop coming up yeah. in October. <laughs> All right, Braulio, what do you got on your mind? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback just a little bit off Kristen, but, um, it, you know, I, in college, I had a professor. Now, this isn't to discourage anyone from making good grades because well, you need good grades, especially in STEM related fields. Um, but, you know, he told me it's not necessarily the grades you make, but it's the hands you shake. And sometimes networking will land you no, positions bro, you, you took and mine. jobs that, that <laughs> well, you know, just you, you could just be another testament. Um, Grades matter, absolutely, obviously, um, you know, and just by saying that, don't, don't be afraid to take a class over again if you feel you need to. You know, some people in college are a little bit in a rush. It, you did, you know, you, you bombed it or something happened personally in your life, take it again. But seriously, networking will get you into places and inside, you know, doors uh, that that your grades might not. Uh, and so, again, you know, picking back off Kristen, um, make yourself known, 
put yourself out there, you know, especially when you land that first job, um, always stand behind your work and, and, and just let people know who you are. And I'll, I'll summarize that. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And it's an old saying, but it's very valid, I think, across mm -hmm. careers, but especially in a field where you could be working for big companies or small companies, um, that seems pretty consistent. What else do you have, V? Yeah, I just want to end with that. Live at the career center at your college if you decide to go. Um, the more they see you, the more they realize that you really want a job or internship, and they'll recommend you to recruiters uh, as a highly qualified candidate who's ready to work. People are a lot nicer networking. <laughs> yeah. Once you know them, then you're in yeah. the loop and you can get recommendations. Uh, yeah, guys, are y'all? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brother. I was going to say, you know, I, I, I mentioned it a little while ago. Uh, I wish I had done more, you know, programs and, and internships in college. I, I didn't, but don't be afraid to do that. You know, Beatrice is is a great example of, of doing that, and that's part of networking itself. You know, getting in the door before even starting a job, uh, you know, is 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 really profound. The companies are a lot more willing to help the intern trying to figure out their their way in life. Um, the best time to learn. Yeah, Absolutely. and get paid. Get paid during your internship. I would highly advocate for that. Yeah, I would tell a lot of people that are in engineering, I don't even consider the unpaid ones. There's mm -hmm. paid opportunities that you could do. Like, don't even look at those. <laughs> So are y'all going to be providing your contact information just in case people listening or following up, viewing this video later, uh, want to reach out for questions? Yep. So I can post that on the Facebook. Okay. Event. Great. We don't have any questions posted in our Zoom meeting um, or on Facebook Live, but they might come in later. So we'll keep those communication lines open. Mm -hmm. And we'll, I'll post the recording of this video on there as well. Awesome. awesome. Well, B, thanks for providing us this space. I think the Ubata Foundation is awesome. Uh, for those that are listening or now or listening later, I would definitely recommend checking out uh, the website, which is uh, part of, it's posted, I believe, in a link where our event is, mm -hmm. um, as well as keep tuned. I'm gonna share my screen right now for the upcoming event. This is something that I think is really big, uh, is resume building. So that's something that the teachers would benefit from knowing as well, but just learning what really counts on a resume and how to make a resume look, look great and appeasable to, appeasable, I don't think that's a word, but appealable to employers. Uh, <laughs> B, did you have any closing comments you wanted to provide? Uh, nope. I just, um, this was a great learning experience. This is the first event that we've put on, and I hope that we can continue to connect our alumni with our students and uh, fix that pipeline of communication. Seems to be a leak somewhere, and, and we don't really need to reinvent the wheel anymore. We can talk about our experiences with students and make sure they learn from our mistakes and keep them from committing the same ones. All right. But mistakes are good. They are. They help Sometimes you learn. Sometimes they're the best lessons in, in life. <laughs> they are. Beatrice, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for putting this together, honestly. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for participating. <laughs> maybe do we want to stop recording and stay online and maybe chat about this next opportunity, or do we yeah. want to touch base later? So I can stop recording now. You'll hear it announced.